Hello again. Hello. Hey. Hello. So this is our first Lit in the Library event uh, that the English department is presenting. I hope that we will promote our literature classes and that you guys will take more literature classes. Give it up for VLPA classes, people. Katie Masuga flew in from Paris for this reading. In, in, in your honor, I'm wearing the tie I bought in Paris 20 years ago for two dollars. It's, it's never tied correctly, ever, not once. So like 10 francs? Or 10 francs, yeah, not euros then. Um, all right, I'm just going to read a little bit of an introduction about uh, Katie and her book. Katie Masuga, University of Paris Sorbonne Fellow, holds a PhD in Comparative Literature and a joint PhD in Literary Theory and Criticism from the U of Washington. That's in Seattle, folks. Give it up for Seattle. Woo! Give it up for comparative literature. Yeah. Uh, with a focus on comparative modernisms and image and text relations moving broadly across genres, period, and languages. She is the author of The Secret Violence of Henry Miller, Henry Miller and How It Got That Way, the great title, as well as numerous essays, anthology chapters, and fiction, nonfiction, blurring short stories. The Origin of Vermilion that she's going to read from is her first novel. Uh, the Origin of Vermilion is composed of intertwining stories that move across four centuries. It springs from the author's own story, born in prison, haunted by premonitory dreams and transformed by motherhood. And I hope there'll be a brief Q&A after, because I think people might want to ask about that. Uh, the book tells three stories through an interlinking narrative, the narrator's physical and spiritual journey to unexpectedly becoming a mother. Um, your daughter is in the back, listening intently. Um, a collection of alternating mixed media vignettes on the childhood of the narrator's mother and her final abandonment of her 10 children. Katie comes from a large family. The Faustian tale of the man with the watch of the 17th century who appears in the narrator's visions. At its core, the origin of Vermilion is a reflection on the nature of writing, memory, truth, fiction, and the concept of the collective existence of humanity. And I hope you're taking notes, English 151. <laughs> Katie Masuga, folks. Katie Masuga, welcome. Thank you, Greg. And thank you, everyone, for coming. This is really quite an honor. <clears throat> so, yeah. this, you know, Seattle is kind of my, one of my homes, so it's nice to be back for a brief time. Right, so that was quite a, yeah, this book kind of, as you can see, tries to encompass quite a, quite a few things. And so what I, I'm going to do here is I've got five different um, passages I'd like to share with you. And I try to cover all three of those different um, storylines, if you will. And the, the bumping of the bass is a wonderful background. <laughs> So in a couple events I've been doing, um, this is going to sound really fantastic, but it's a bit of an exaggeration. I've had to sell the copy each time that I've been reading from, because for whatever reason I've run out, and that sounds like they're selling like hotcakes, but it really just means I didn't bring enough books into the room. And so that means each time I have to find my bookmarkers again, and I have to make sure that I have the right spots. And I'm choosing, trying to choose different passages for everybody to hear a variety. Okay, I take courage from Black Elk, and as his story floats through my head, my current thoughts are strangely bound to that exceptionally darkly dreamy image I had encountered during my last night sleeping on the outskirts in the countryside of Ulaanbaatar. I was in Mongolia exactly one year ago. There were orphan children, and I went because I was an orphan child too, not in the same way as them but I was compelled and so I went and so I helped them and they helped me. I've recently been having strange dreams of my mom and not, I believe, because she is gone now, this time forever, but because I feel something has been compelling her presence toward me. Since my trip to Mongolia, I've been invaded by her appearance more than ever. In one, she is wearing new glasses out of which she cannot see. In another, she is a child speaking about her beloved Gramps to no one. Or am I there too, her audience? In another, we are together, my mother again just a child, overlooking her own poor mother as she struggled and died in childbirth, the baby along with her. In another, 
She was instructing me in proper swimming form with consternation and a severe stone-cut expression. There are too many to keep count. There are too many to reflect upon. We never had swimming lessons. We never had any kind of lessons. We were often left dirty and hungry in the dark and cold for days on end. We played hobo and survival and indoor camping. We ate marshmallows cooked in the fireplace for breakfast and stale croutons for dinner in the dark because we had no electricity, because those are the only things we could find in the house, scavenging high and low for food in all the cupboards with no adults to help. We bought one cent pieces of candy shaped like strawberries at the gas station. Across those thousands of days, she was there and not there for thousands more until she is now never there again. The details of the darkly dreamy image in my mind today from that night in Ulaanbaatar were not of my mom. They are once again deeply vivid and have developed into a narrative. The story is so peculiar I'm unable to shake it. I recall here the details. Two young girls were sent through time to make things right that might have happened somehow wrongly deep in the past. And so they arrived somewhere casual, in their jeans, out of place, but calm, knowing. They found a woman having a baby in a telephone booth. The explanation I was given that fell into my head without its being spoken was that the child was named after one of the girls, along with a German diminutive suffix. So the baby's name was Heinlein, the two girls immediately traveled to the mid-17th century and saw a strangely clothed man whose face they could not at first see. He was holding a leather satchel, had a pocket watch, dark hair, and a beard. He gave them a fantastically styled key, holding it out to them on a short black string. And it was understood that this key was the token of engagement that he should have given to the woman who had just bore the child in another time, and who, in fact, maybe had been one of the two girls themselves. He urged them to return 42 years in the past to stop a certain coming marriage signified by the key. I found myself 42 years in the future, still to be unmarried, the man with the watch explained to me. For that reason, he continued to explain in his own words, I sought to return to the past to find this woman and to marry her. He paused and added, Somehow later, I felt the idea to be a tremendous mistake. He could not yet fathom the consequences. It seemed that he had disrupted things as they were to be, as they should be. And in his estimation, it was up to those two girls to correct this misdeed as they walked, walking across old, dark railroad tracks, calmly, silently, suspended in a space that does not actually exist or that no longer exists. They didn't believe why this desire was something to be corrected, since it, since it seemed as though what he did, what had happened with the man and the key and the woman in the booth with the child, that it was all for what it should be, and nothing should be undone, nothing could be undone. That's passage one. Passage two, uh, just to note, the book contains, so one of my specialties is image and text relations. There are images in the book, and the passage I want to read right now is in relation to a very famous painting that I'm sure you've all seen um, by Velázquez called Las Meninas, and it's a picture that you can find later, pick up a copy of the book and find inside. What we learn from Foucault's analysis is that the painting's spatial structure indicates there are peculiar, sorry, particular figures somehow residing outside the painting and yet are in a seemingly paradoxical manner literally included in the painting. There are, of course, two paintings. The one that we see as the spectator of Las Meninas and the one that is being painted by Velázquez within the frame. Looking closely, we observed through the mirror at the back of the room King Philip IV and his second, wife, his second wife and niece Mariana of Austria, the apparent subjects of the painting within the frame. Unexpectedly, we see the painter himself in the process of representation. And we also see a spectator, not unlike us, the viewer of the process standing in the doorway. These, as theory tells us, are the three requirements of any work of art. The artist, 
the creation itself and the audience, and are here included not simply as representation of representation, but rather as an introduction to modernity. There is something behind this canvas, Velasquez taps us on the shoulder and whispers, Foucault explains. Here is the man, the one who is representing. This is not a depiction of reality. This is a construction. And even stranger still, Foucault says, we can only know this through historical change or difference. We see the transformation before Velasquez and through him and out of him. He provokes our own modernity, but he himself does not, cannot live within it. So that's part two. Judge Roy Bean worked as an embargo runner in Texas for the Confederacy during the Civil War. He had begun his life in Kentucky, had various exploits in California, including goods trader, bullwhacker, murderer, and jailbreaker. He subsequently became a barkeep, fleeing his criminal past, setting up a saloon with his brother in New Mexico, eventually moving to San Antonio, where he ran a blockade of cotton in exchange for goods to the British ships supporting the South. He then tried his hand as a teamster, logger, dairy farmer, and butcher. At 41, he married his Mexican teen bride, Virginia, had four children, left them in San Antonio, and opened a saloon in the lawless area near the Picos River, which he named Vinegaroon, and where he was appointed Justice of the Peace in 1882. Calling himself the law west of the Picos, Bean ran his cord out of his saloon. With the advancement of the Transcontinental Railroad, he moved west to an area soon to be called Langtree, which being falsely claimed to have named after the untouchable source of his affections, the beautiful starlet and socialite Lily Langtree. Bean briefly forced a meeting with Jay Gould in 1890 when he signaled Gould's train to make an emergency stop at Langtree, despite the actual lack of emergency. It is said that the pair consequently shared a two-hour drink, the abrupt and unexpected halting of the train, thought to have been a blinding crash in which Gould was killed, briefly disrupted the New York Stock Exchange. The Belle of Jersey among the Channel Islands, Lily Langtree was born in America in 1853, but only became a citizen in 1897 while living in California. She spent her childhood in the Channel Islands where her father was the Dean of Jersey. She married at age 20 and moved to London, beginning a winding string of love affairs and relocations. After sitting for an extraordinarily flattering portrait for English painter Frank Miles, her reputation exploded onto the upper class London social scene and she became an instant sensation. Considered exceptionally beautiful, Langtree began starring in stage productions, her inexhaustible image desired whether by photograph or painting. Witty, intelligent, and friends with Oscar Wilde, Langtree was hated by critics and loved by the public. Her life is a patchwork of marriages and affairs, including mistress to the Prince of Wales, Prince Louis of Battenberg, and various American millionaires. A life as colorful as Bean's, Langtree also tried her hand in wine, horse racing, and world's first celebrity endorser, paradoxically always remaining in financial straits. Langtree spent the end of her life in Monaco, where she died age 75, having raised one child whose father has never been confirmed. The real fear of Gould's death in 1890 by railway accident may have been inspired by Langtree's actual catastrophe when, in 1888, her entire carriage of racehorses plummeted off a cliff on the way to an event in Chicago and perished, all but one, Saint Savior. My mother loved Lily Langtree, so much so that when she and my father got together, they had a shotgun-style wedding at Knott's Berry Farm where a false Judge Roy Bean married patrons in a recreated Jersey Lily saloon. My folks had never really married, though. My mother had already had her fill of a life with a man having seven children and watching him die a young, quick death. It was common knowledge that my mother never married my father, and so that made the three of us between them bastards. It was an awful term to my mind, though we were taught to believe that it was old-fashioned to care. 
When I was 10, my mother flew out to Texas, and after some mysterious arrangements, where I felt she was transformed into the Jersey native herself, she drove back to California in an old white pickup truck with a blue stripe along the side that she bought out there secondhand. The truck, too, was some part of the mysterious transformation. Where had it come from and why? She hadn't consulted us on it. It was an emblem of what was to come, which at the time felt fresh and exciting, but would turn destabilizing and impossible. Disappearing to Texas, only to turn up several weeks later in her new used blue truck, my mom appeared brighter and ambitious, full of intangible Langtree magic. The Narnian wardrobe seemed to open, inviting us all to step through fantastically and paradoxically remaining shrouded in a supernatural darkness that, as in a fairy tale way, could never be penetrated. It instead enveloped me, laying a thin layer of invisible pixie dust on my eyes so that the world around me felt soft and sweet, but also hidden and darkly, frighteningly mysterious. There was a lot of excitement and commotion over Mom's trip to Texas and new arrangements when she returned. She started to work on opening up her own bar in our small town in the style of Langtree, an old-fashioned saloon. Everything had a Langtree touch, the meaning of which I did not at all understand, but felt its enchanting dark beauty. The history of Judge Roy Bean and Lily Langtree became an enormous and powerful myth, something I conceded I would never understand, but I could watch my mother in awe and think both of the things she knew about the history and the story, and more breathtakingly, what she or anyone didn't know, what couldn't be known, because it was the base of the mystery itself. And now for part four, and section four, passage four, much later in the book. I decided to walk back to the Bibliothèque Nationale <clears throat> hoping once again to speak to someone about the case of ancient keys. I was not sure what I was looking for anymore, if it was something that would explain the story of the man with the watch. Still, I am drawn to it as though its origin is connected to my future. I walk from my place to the, li sorry, the walk from my place to the library takes about an hour, passing through many different neighborhoods on the way. The city is in constant flux with traffic and noise, and the air is always unsettled. Pedestrians cross at every corner, angle, direction, without hesitation, without looking, without right. Cars are honking horns, swerving, cursing, gesticulating, taxis dropping off passengers, picking up others, businessmen and tourists hailing them unsuccessfully 20 paces into the road. <clears throat> Hairdressers are beating old rugs against the trees along the boulevard. Smoky steam rises up from the hot plate of the crate vendors. The eyes of patrons look blank around, blankly around as they drink dirty espressos on the cafe tables outside. Someone is pushing dirty water into the gutter in front of their shop with an aching, soggy broom. The sidewalks are littered with unnameables. Dogs are walked. Cigarettes are inhaled and discarded. Change is dropped into dirty plastic coffee cups placed in front of beggars with old pieces of luggage overflowing with dark clothing, grocery bags, blankets, books, mysterious objects bulging against the sides. I arrived at the Bureau des Objets Colonial de la Renaissance et de l'Empire Mongol, again during office hours, the Office of Colonial Objects of the Renaissance and the Mongol Empire. It looked no different than on my last two visits, just as musty, just as empty. I knocked on each door along the corridor without any response from within until the last one. Almost immediately, I heard a small and distant entrée. Surprised yet with a mechanical response, I opened the door cautiously and was met with a small stuffy room cluttered with books, objects, folders, papers sticking out in all directions, a layer of dust upon everything, and golden rods of light beaming in through the sole window, highlighting the gentle particles of sky as they floated through the very still space. In one corner of the small room was an old wooden desk darkened creases along its length, harboring the muck from years past. The desk was also covered in such a variety of papers and objects that it looked completely useless. Behind it sat a man clearly in his 80s or even older, wearing a warm gray suit jacket and beige slacks. His shirt was creased, faded, the tips of the collar bending upward. The top of his bald head was covered in liver spots. His eyebrows were overgrown and curling down toward his watery blue eyes. 
His mouth hung partway open as he greeted my entrance, half surprised, half indifferent, and I saw his rigid yellowing teeth and the dry cracking edges of his lips quiver slightly. I couldn't understand why such an old man would still be working in an office. Bonjour, monsieur. J'espère que je ne vous dérange pas. I hope I'm not bothering you. Bonjour. Est-ce qu'il y a quelque chose avec lequel je peux vous aider? Is there something I can help you with? I am interested in the collection of ancient keys that I just saw outside in the hall. Now my old man was. And what is it that interests you? Could you tell me more about them? I'm afraid there isn't a lot I am able to share. In particular, I'm interested in the key that is missing with a marker, its image, fourth from the right, the 17th century key that, ah, he exclaimed, cutting me off, his face now alight. That key was recovered, he cut himself off. I was a young man, he added softly, looking now toward the window. His gaze turned inward as though taken by old memories. Yes, well, what is its origin? He continued staring blankly ahead for several moments and was suddenly startled back into awareness. Hmm? Oh, yes, well, you read the description? I did. Well, yes, I'm afraid we don't know much more than that. These kinds of things, he waved his arms carelessly and sighed with an air of exasperation, but more of resignation. I had a feeling he knew something more, but could not say. I wanted to press the matter, but needed to restrain myself. Well, monsieur, where is the key? I see it is no longer in the display case. Has it been moved? Its description does not address its absence. The old man's entire presence seemed to shrink and darken. Please, he said, have a seat. I did. I'm afraid, he began again, that information is unavailable, he said to me in a somber and unconvincing tone. Pardon? I asked, wondering why he asked me to sit if he had nothing to say. As the old man cleared his throat, he stared directly at me, or through me, into me, for what seemed an eternity. Unfortunately, he began, exhaling deeply, the key is not in our collection. It belongs elsewhere. It was first displayed in the library when I was a young man. I will tell you because, because I can see you have your own personal investment in the relic. I will tell you that this key was the reason I entered this métier. I spent many years, how shall I say, around that key. In fact, it was I who, he paused. Something was causing him to struggle. Monsieur? Ah, well, it was I who brought the key here, but, it is not in the collection here any longer, I'm afraid. I returned his gaze without speaking. He exhaled deeply. It's gone. The key has been removed. Suddenly his words sped up, became curt. His body closed up and he ended abruptly. I persisted. Was the key in the library all that time, or? The old man seemed briefly to relax, giving over somewhat to my innocent inquisition. It is a strange and interesting question. The truth is, and I'm not sure why I need to be telling you this, but the truth is that the key is held privately, as indicated in the description. The owner had in the past loaned it to the library, but has recently removed it. I cannot say why. But, monsieur, you just told me it was you who recovered the key, n'est-ce pas? Yes, indeed, that is true. Thank you for coming. He stared straight at me, unflinchingly, and with speaking something unspoken. Yes, monsieur. I replied, realizing I had probably asked too many questions, and thus took my cue to leave. Thank you for your time. Yes, he said, and then added quickly, please do come again. I looked at him in surprise. His eyes softened, looking kind, and our gazes were locked as I rose from my seat until I turned toward the door. Merci beaucoup. Je vous en prie. You're welcome. And now the final passage, quite near the end, but without giving anything away. Mom wanted to be cremated. She had been working as a cook at a truck stop on the edge of town near the interstate in the small Montana town before she died. Toothless and beaten down, old, aching hands serving greasy, gravy-laden chicken fried steak, wiping down tables with a dirty rag, slowly, painfully hobbling back to the kitchen to fill new orders. Her boss was about to let her go. Too many mistakes, too many apologies, too many second chances when she had to be put in hospice anyway. A month later, she was gone. Mom wanted to give herself to all of us. When each of us was born, she gave us a unique nickname. Mine was Bird. 
In the middle of the night, my younger brother and I divided her ashes up into 10 soap dispensers from the dollar store that one of our older sisters had picked out. We found rubber stoppers at the hardware store that fit perfectly, replacing the little pump. Mom wanted her ashes distributed among her 10 children. We had to do it in the middle of the night because no one wanted to see the bone and ash and bits that were in the bag. My brother was bravest. He handled the bag. I rotated the dispensers with a funnel for him to fill and kept everything organized. We thought about how to divide her perfectly evenly. I got out measuring cups and then measuring spoons. My brother poured one cup in each urn as I moved them down the line on some old newspaper covering the table. We were staying in a motel room in Montana near the university. university. We would judge how much was left to share out, and then my brother would switch to a smaller measuring tool. Next came the half cup. One by one he poured, and I held the little urn and funnel, carefully placing a stopper in each one, keeping track of which one had how much already inside. The urns were plastic cheap and painted a nice color to look like old stone. One had a crack, the plastic was too thin. Good thing we bought an extra. My brother then shifted to the quarter cup, then the tablespoon, then the teaspoon, then a half a teaspoon. Then finally he was eyeing up a quarter teaspoon and an eighth of a teaspoon inside the scoop of the half teaspoon. When she was all divided, we carefully wrapped each one in paper and handcrafted cardboard boxes so that everyone could take her home the next day, flying back to Ohio or California or Oregon or Washington or Paris. Wrapped in paper, and then tissue paper, carefully covered in clear packing tape, then put in a plastic baggie, then finally the little cardboard box. There was mom for each of us. That's how it ended that night with my brother and me giving her over to each of us. Do we look for our own face in the face of our mother, or is it the other way around that she looks for her face in me? I looked at her face and saw death. I look upon the face of my daughter, and what will I see? Thank you. So I guess now I ask if you have questions. Yeah, I think we can have some Q&A, some writing. Everyone's in a creative writing class here, so I'm okay, sure they great. have some questions or just ideas. Some, some might have some ideas. And then Katie did bring some books for sale at the end of the reading, and she'll be hanging around to talk to anybody. So. I would love to give anyone a very fat discount if you would like to buy my books, because I don't want to take them <laughs> with me any further if necessary. First, you have a large one. Actually, two. Yes, questions, thoughts, any reflections? Yes. How much of the book is true versus fiction, or did you change truth into fiction, et cetera, et cetera? How it's much is true, how much is fiction? Um, that's a good question. So one of my biggest influence is W.G. Sable, who does something similar with, and, a, and many writers do, obviously. But I find that really interesting, the blurring of the fact in fiction with the images as well. You know, when you read Sable's Austerlitz, do, who's the kid on the cover, or who is the, who is the, is the film still inside the book really a picture of X Y Z person? So yeah, it's a tricky question because I obviously don't want to give everything away, but I can say that I am a bit of a purist when it comes to the facts of my life, I guess. So much of what is about the narrator is, is very true, but you know, honestly, you have to read the whole book right down to the last line to know what's happening. And it would, in some ways, invalidate the question because of the way I think that the novel works with and around the idea. I know that sounds super vague, which is the idea to get you to read the book. But indeed, I think um, I name another one of my influences as Borges. So in fact, there's definitely an element of magical realism as well. So it's toying with that. So I, I suppose I went beyond my own limits and tried to explore what would happen if I do change. Uh, change is kind of a slippery word, but change um, the fact. Because again, it, talking about magical realism, it's really that it's transforming it 
into something that could still be considered fact, but is much more um, dreamy. And again, there's a, a huge dream element here, and we can't negate that as fact, right? If you see what I mean. So, does that answer? <laughs> yeah, Sufficiently, good. inadequately, very appropriately, good. inadequately. How did I start writing this book? Right, so um, it started with a dream. It started with a dream, and it was one of those unshakable dreams that I just had to write down and investigate, and that was really the kernel of it. And it started to grow on its own, as those things do, um, where I would try to imagine um, beyond that dream or expand the dream, and then I do some research, and then I started discovering some really peculiar connections between my dream and some historical reality that I had no uh, way to even understand why they were uh, connecting like that, with the, the figure of Heinlein that I mentioned at the beginning, and the man with the watch thing. So that was all from a dream, and then it turned out there were like historical truths to it. So it was when I, had the dream, and then subsequently I was pregnant with my daughter when I wrote most of it. So that um, influenced much of the, the other uh, personal aspects. And I guess it might have been shortly after, well, somewhat shortly after my mom died as well. So that gets folded in too. Yes? Uh, did you dedicate or write the book for anyone? Is it daughter, your mother, or yourself? Okay, did I dedicate or write it for anyone? Well, um, yes and no. I think the, dedica the dedicate it is dedicated to my daughter, Melaine, which came after the fact, though. That's like, oh, you know, it's about to get published, and the publisher's like, do you want a dedication? Oh, yeah, sure. But, yeah, she's definitely very much included in the book. Um, can tell you that, so the book is called The Origin of Vermilion. Her middle name is Vermilion. <laughs> so in many ways, yeah. But again, though, it, it was that experience probably of being pregnant while I was writing it and that mystery of what is to come. So I didn't know her yet. And then it was published just this year, and she's three now. So the book was written um, several years ago. But it comes together. So it took about two years to write, and then, I guess, another two years to get published. Yeah. Yes. So writing is a lot of hard work, and I'm wondering you know, what your process is to give you a little bit of a system. I don't. I'm lousy. I am lousy for that question, because, you know, I did my PhD on Henry Miller, and he had one of these great charts that he had right in front of him on the wall, the Ten Commandments of Writing, you know, and I don't even remember what they were. It's like, don't, um, don't, don't get up until you finish X, Y, Z, this and that. But then, at the, you know, one of the last ones is, and don't take this too seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, change at will or something like that. For me, um, having also done the kind of academic side, or still doing the academic side of writing, I, I actually have found that doing both simultaneously has been very fruitful, so that one could sort of, if you get exhausted with one, you go to the other. I mean, and I'm sure you're all learning this, the writers out there, that writing isn't quite, or, or I should say getting published, or writing well, isn't what you first imagine it to be, that it really does take that commitment and, and regularity, you know, like routine is your best friend, even though it seems um, to the audience, to the reader, as counter-creative, but it's not, completely not. I mean, that's really what you need. So, um, so yeah, for me it would be that I was uh, writing academic stuff and I'd take a break and do the creative stuff and kind of balance them with each other. But I don't have a time a time, like a strict time to write, you know, 8 to 10 in the morning or something like that. I mean, I have a toddler, so <laughs> that makes scheduling anything difficult. I'm definitely a midnight oil kind of person for that reason, I guess, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes? 
I'll just make a, a couple yeah. comments and then and then a question. Uh, I was really when you're talking about the key, I was really hearing more days, so that was interesting. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. And, uh, I and my two sisters went through precisely the same process with my mom and her mom's Oh, okay. As well, so that really took me back to. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, and then flying home and having the uh, yeah. the uh, security person at the at the X-ray saying what's what's in the thing, and telling them and watching their face while they meet, felt guilty about it. Mm -hmm. um, my question was, uh, what's the most memorable reading you've done, and, uh, and why? Well, I'm new to this. You know, it's my third book, but it's my first novel. So um, the two other books, the academic Henry Miller Henry Miller books, I didn't have. You know, loads of readings. I mean, maybe, maybe the cliche answer. Well, I guess I'm supposed to say this one. <laughs> this is this is fabulous, absolutely. Um, yeah, this is a wonderful dynamic. Last night I read it for a million, so it's a totally different experience. I mean, you're in a bar. There, there was a baby cry at that one as well, which was mine. There's <laughs> another baby here. Um, and I read at Shakespeare Company in Paris last week, so that might be the kind of cliche answer, just because it's Shakespeare Company. And for the, the other reason that I was actually very nervous at that reading, and when I got to that, I did read that same last passage about the cremation, and I could barely speak it. I could barely get the words out. Was, my throat was all closed up. And I even had to stop myself and tell the audience, this is going to be hard. And everybody kind of gasped. So today was much, much easier. Yeah. So that was probably memorable for a, you know, not very exciting reason, but memorable. Yeah. I have one, a couple of comments. So one of them is that I noticed that your writing flows incredibly well in the way that my writing ever does. Thank you. Um, I've always had a hard time writing transitions myself, and sometimes I sort of jar from one topic to another. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing, is that you speak a bit of good both English and French, which is very impressive. Um, how does Paris, I know that Paris is like a legendary literary city, is there a reason for that? I'm probably not the authority to answer that question. Um, Paris has been, yeah, I mean, we start with Paris. Why is Paris the place? Oh, well, yeah, but why might be the question. Why did that ever begin? It is beautiful. I guess I could maybe shorten it to what I know, and that is my specialty is 20th century writers in Paris, in particular Americans and English people in Paris. And so, of course, the draw to Paris at that time was because it already had the reputation as a literary city, but for another reason, which was that um, around the turn of the century and around World War I, it was really wonderful and easy for Americans to go have an inexpensive bohemian life in Paris. And so all, yeah, it was very cheap at that time. And you can imagine in America where there was a ban on alcohol prohibition, everybody was flocking to Europe and to Paris as the kind of center of Europe to have a good time. It was the jazz age and um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's what I know about the 20th century. But of course, prior to that, I mean, Paris has just a massive history of literary greats. <coughs> And um, not just literary, but it's probably more connected with all the arts. I mean, if you think about the first civilizations of Paris were um, uh, the Roman. I mean, we're talking like more than 2,000 years ago, building fantastic structures and being like a, a military heart of Europe. And of course, that just develops into all kinds of cultural avenues. So just explode it. Um, but there was another thing I wanted to respond to, your, your comment, your fr oh, the flowing thing. Yeah, that's a, I like that comment because um, uh, I get that from Henry Miller, actually, you know, this, the, the flow. And he has this great line in, uh, it's probably Tropic of Cancer, but I'm not sure, where he says, I love everything that flows. 
And um, I find that beautiful because it, we can interpret that in many ways, but the way that um, he writes is also quite flowing. And the way I wrote this was in fact, in, I was challenging myself to, to connect incredibly disparate subjects. I mean, as you saw, I was jumping around and hopefully you got a sense of the really different things happening. But part of the, the real purpose was to show that everything does connect and we can find the flow. It's just in how we're looking at it. It's all interconnected or we're all interconnected. Yeah, please. Uh, one more. Um, so obviously this book is a lot about motherhood and then I remember Greg mentioned that in his intro to you. Um, I was just curious about, you know, where you are now in motherhood. Uh -huh. you know, are you raising your child as a single mother? Uh -huh. Is it in Paris? Yes, and, and yes, also yes, your yes, connection I'll be to your mother's motherhood experience and how do you yeah. think it's different? Yeah, well, how long do we have? Um, oh, five minutes. <laughs> so I was born in prison. I was the ninth of ten children to my mother. And um, she got out, I don't know, maybe a year later. And then she went back into prison when I was a, a preteen. And when she got out that time, she disappeared for like ten years. Um, so I didn't see her again until I was in my 20s. And then, um, and then she died ten years after that as a toothless alcoholic. So I didn't have, so this is a huge um, source of mystery for me, actually. So my childhood did not really include much mothering. And that's why I think it's, you know, I'm exploring all of that and what it's like for me now to be a mother. And yes, I am, um, I'm expecting a second child, and I am actually a single parent. So, um, yeah, it's, it's day by day is so strange to wonder how, I mean, and I guess everybody who is a parent wonders if and how to do it right. And I, you know, I think my experience has then also doubled up on that since I was really raised by my brother who was, I mean, we were very poor and he was fabulous and he was like 23, you know, at the time he was raising three teenagers. So, yeah, it's motherhood. Um, you know, we send him flowers on Mother's Day. So, and I, you know, I grew up on frozen dinners and pizza. So it's a very different experience. And I'm in Paris now. Opposite end of what I experienced, but it's very much with me. Yes, Did you do a lot of research to write that book? Yes, yes, yes. And how did you do your research? Oh, in front of a computer, online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what makes the world like easy the these do. days. What? Like the rest of us do. Exactly. <laughs> that's what we get now, and it's very handy. You can whip out a book just like that in front of the Yeah, honestly. And, I mean, from, I had to explore, you know, there's some other things in here. There's some documents, historical documents and stuff like that. But yeah, pretty much on online. Um, maybe some library visits, but honestly, there's a lot to find online, some books and things. It's, there's so much historical information that I didn't know before I wrote this book, so yeah, a lot of research. Our class period is ended. Okay. But you're going to hang around for yeah, I'll be I want to talk to you, so thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. But let's say 10. If anybody wants one, if that's still too high, we can discuss something. Thank you.